All right, so that forest pronunciation was Whakawirawira, <laughs> just, just for clarification. <laughs> so we're on the edge of um, Whakawirawira Forest. Um, this is Te Poranui o Tutiata, that's the Māori name that was gifted to this building. Um, and this, so I've just entitled this talk Future Context because it's really about uh, the future context of engineered timber. Um, the building is a collaboration between our practice RDA studio and Irving Smith Architects in Nelson. Um, but we couldn't have done this project without the significant involvement of um, and the talent of uh, Dunning Thornton structural engineers and Alistair Catmack in particular. So this project started um, with a, a national competition to design a innovation hub. And, and so we collaborated at two practices and we um, designed this building. The brief was quite different at this stage. We designed this about six or seven years ago. And what won the competition, I think, for us was that we, prior to this building, <coughs> we had been working on first and second generation timber engineered constructions where the cost of the metal components that are post tensioning, you can see on the floor slab there, the post tensioning components that connect these shear columns to the concrete slab became very, very expensive. So the, the, the way of building in timber was, was seven or eight years ago, very expensive in New Zealand. So we looked, um, there's one of those post-tensioning elements there, uh, seismic restraints as well. Um, so we looked at a very at a very simple system that didn't need to employ these um, expensive post-tensioning steel um, pieces of equipment. So we looked at a simple layout of shear columns running in alternate directions. And then just a very simple engineered timber floor, joists and beams, um, plywood floor, same system on the roof, with nothing more than nails and a nail plate. We proposed this innovation centre that looked like this, clad in plywood to protect the um, CLT, which doesn't have the external timber treatment to uh, be able to offer um, external material. So. The innovation here was to do something really, really dumb in a sense, to dumb it down, to be able to build in timber in a very, very simple way, and a very um, prefabricated way in a pack and a flat pack sort of the components brought to site, and the whole thing goes together very quickly. So that led to this simple building that was the winner of this competition and got us involved. It was repeatable so that Scion could um, add more and more units. Um, but then there was a pause while we did some master planning for the site and what was actually discovered was that there was a need for a, a new, the, the brief change to the sense, there was a need for a new innovation hub, a, a centre for the scientists to come together in a workplace environment and also Simon decided they were going to open the front door of this campus to the public so the brief changed and we suggested through the master planning phase that we wind up um, putting a building right in the heart of the campus, but more about that later. I think first of all, I just want to set the scene also. Most of you probably won't need to be reminded that we're in a climate crisis right now and timber construction is not just a luxury, but it's, a, it's an absolute necessity if we're going to meet the targets that are required to prevent the full effects of climate change. In New Zealand, we know, in the world, we know that we've already um, that we're going to have 300 um, millimetres of sea level rise by 2060. We're already at 2022, um, with one, we have one degree of surface warming on the planet, so we're, we're trying to stop this at one and a half degrees, two degrees, we're almost halfway there. And the effects of this um, are really obvious. You know, in, in New Zealand, we have coastal erosion, um, and we're looking at ways to either retreat from the coast and not build there or mitigate the effects of climate change in other ways. So I like to talk about two scenarios. Scenario one, um, if we're going to reduce emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, um, then we'll be carbon zero by 2050. Uh, New Zealand has these targets to be carbon zero by 2050. But the globe needs every team of five million. 
to in the world to do their bit if, if we're going to reduce global climate change. New Zealand will show global leadership if we reach that goal. New Zealand will benefit as first adopters in the new renewable, sustainable, sustainable global economy. But if we, if we do achieve this, we're still going to have half a metre of sea level rise by 2100. 100 year coastal flooding events will happen every year and New Zealand will be 1.5 degrees warmer and we'll have a 30% increase in drought events. Australia, where you'll have your own set of um, statistics that'll come from that. But scenario two is, is a disaster. If we do nothing with no policy intervention at all, then we'll end up by 2100 with one and a half metres of sea level rise. There'll be 1.5 billion people globally that are affected by sea level rise. There'll be no ice fields or glaciers left on the planet. We'll have two billion people that'll be reliant on going somewhere other than their kitchen tap to get fresh, fresh water and almost half the world's population is going to be affected. So there's a real necessity to create low carbon buildings for this planet's survival. So the ambition of this product, of this project, was to demonstrate a prototype for realistic and affordable change to commercial construction. As a practice, we're following the same benchmarks that the nation has set to reduce the amount of embodied and operational carbon that the buildings we design produce on an incremental basis by 2050. So if we're going to get to zero by 2050, we have to drop by a third by 2030, two thirds by 2040. So yeah, as, as you're all aware, there's, there's two sides to um, carbon emissions and buildings. There's the operational carbon and the embodied carbon. The challenge has always been, you know, you can make a steel and glass building that might be carbon zero in terms of its operational um, performance. But, you know, but it, it might be heavily embodied with, with carbon in terms of the materials that it uses. On the other hand, you know, we can, we can make a, an embodied carbon zero building, but it might look like something out of a storybook. So the idea here was to try and design a building that was, that was performing well from embodied and operational, but also looked good and was meaningful to its location. Ten years ago, we designed the building on the left, which approached carbon neutrality in terms of its operation, but it was made of steel and glass, and it was incredibly heavy in terms of its footprint of embodied energy. And sign on the right is carbon zero embodied energy and very low operational embodied. The drawing on the left is a shop drawing for one of the towers of the six towers of the building in the photograph I just showed you. That's all steel. Building on the right, just the red, the red elements are the steel and the grey the gray elements are some concrete foundations. So I'll start the story with um, New Zealand. Here we are in the southern region of the South Pacific. And, you know, when things arrive by boat, they really do arrive by boat. And a lot of New Zealand building materials arrive this way, concrete and some of our steel, aluminium, glass. But what we do have in New Zealand is a lot of renewable um, and sustainably grown pine forest. And so that's what this building pursues. This is the location of Sion in the central North Island in the middle of our forestry grown region. And Sion um, are essentially an ex-government department that researches wood fibre technology and forestry production in New Zealand. And we do research for New Zealand, but also for the rest of the world. Cutting edge global research goes, goes on in this environment. When we arrived at the project, this was their front door. This concrete monstrosity was the reception of the front door asylum. And so we set about, as I mentioned earlier, on a, on a master planning process. That orange line shows the circuitous route that you would take almost through the back door of the campus to arrive at that underwhelming front door. The blue the blue square drawn there is where the Scion hub is, is now um, located. So we turn the campus around. On the left hand side is Whakawirawira Forest. It's one of the largest tourist attractions in Rotorua. Um, there's mountain biking park there. It's on the edge of the geothermal region. And a million tourists a year prior to COVID would arrive at this forest. And now this campus now turns itself around and looks at the front door. And now the entrance to this campus is from the green approach, not the red approach. So that's the, that we demolished a small portion of the campus. You can see the rest of the buildings where the laboratories and workshops are um, 
sort of tentacle octopus like a bit of an octopus, so it's well located in terms of being central to the campus. Some early studies in terms of the massing of that building, um, the massing in terms of its height. Um, just in terms of the program of the building, the entire ground floor is devoted to public. So it's open to the public during office hours. There's a reception there in the green in front of the front door. There's a front reception. There's an exhibition where the public can come and see in a museum style exhibition uh, the fun and excitement that goes on in this um, building. And there's also a couple of meeting rooms where asylum staff can meet in a public environment, their visitors. But almost half the footprint is devoted to a public cafe, which is also available for the staff, so the public and staff can meet. But more importantly, so that people can come here as a local attraction, uh, bring their families, their friends, have a good wood-fired pizza, um, some craft beer, and sit in, in a pretty stunning building. So it's exposing wood technology to the public by making it a public building. And from this ground floor, to access control, um, visitors and staff of Scion can get access to the um, private research areas of the institution. On the upper two, two levels, this is where the, the live science happens. This, this is also access control through the stairs, so the public don't have access to this, but the top two floors are where scientists work, collaborate, workshop, um, have meetings, and they bring, they, they, they come from the sort of Strategies of the tentacles, their labs, and workshop with their fellow employees and visitors and collaborators in this building. So that's the program of the building, um, the, the exterior facade. So I'm going to sort of just walk through the structure. This is probably one of the more fascinating um, parts of the story. Um, it's a diagrid timber structure. And now the way we've been building with timber in the past is the same way that we've been building with concrete and steel. We've been bolting timber together in large chunks in a right angle way, but the way that timber works with its strands and fibers running in one direction is much more of a diagonal approach with the transfer of strength through, through the parallel motion of the strands of the timber. So when we conceive this building, we also conceive the transfer of structure in the same way that a tree and a branch might in an in angular way rather than a rectangle way. We then took out the heavy mass of the concrete floor, which provides un in seismic um, loads, which this site is highly seismic. Um, the weight and mass at those upper levels is a phenomenally hard thing to deal with with the structure of a building. So we lightened that by making all the timber floors timber. And then we attacked the joints. Initially, we, intend we envisage these joints being steel joints, but Sion as our client challenged us to remove the steel from here. So in this early rendering, you can see steel um, hub nodes where the timber is connected. In reality, we managed to get rid of the steel from these joints completely, except for a seismic fuse which exists on the ground floor only. And this is a sacrificial seismic fuse that in the event of an earthquake, the energy is dissipated into that steel where it can deform, the steel joint can be removed and um, replaced. So that's a detailed drawing of that of those two diamonds coming together and lightly bolted to that seismic joint. And, and, and then in other joints where we don't have the seismic fuse, we are literally just um, fixing these diamonds together with screws and a dovetail jointed connection. So these are some of the sort of production drawings that were produced, but essentially this, the, the finger joint um, approach is the answer to creating the, um, the strength in these joints, um, creating the continuity of the angular timber to the vertical timber to the angular timber, and then the seismic joint is only there to absorb um, the seismic forces under under a under a seismic event. So you can see a detailed shot of that there. Um, so during the, the the development process of this with Alistair Kenning, our structural engineer, we developed a prototype of these joints and then we used the facilities of Scion's institution to test these um, you know under under, under artificial force. And they proved the theory 
plus some. So they, they were built up to the theoretical strength points, and then we pushed them beyond that until they broke, and they were well above the thresholds of the design. So it's interesting in terms of um, the process of construction, we employed an ECI process, early contractor involvement, and we started engaging with the timber manufacturers before we had even found ourselves a main contractor to build the building. So all of that research work was undertaken with Timberlad, who um, are a local manufacturer. Um, they, they don't make CLT or LVL, but they, um, they mill it and with a CNC mill it into the shape. So they fabricated all of the diamond joints of this building. And so these are these drawings. So after we had been modelled the building for our architectural and, and consultant set, we then hand that BIM model over and Timberlab, they, they redraw essentially the whole building and convert it into their own CAD BIM model, which then becomes their manufacturer model as well. So they like, locate every joint, every beam, every, um, every diagonal piece, and they um, then produce what well, they then produce their set of of um, manufacturing drawings, which are these drawings here. So each diamond is drawn in two dimensions and three dimensions. And then they take it into a three dimensional virtual um, virtual software to test it under, to virtually test it before it goes into the CNC milling machines. But before they mill it, they um, they lay it up, and so each one of these diamonds, diamonds within this, this Scion building is made out of LVL, laminated veneer lumber. So lots of thin layers of veneer glued together. So these are the, the brass frames. It's quite a crude. It's quite um, it's quite low tech. This phase of the job. So those braces um, are literally just top and bottom of the LVL veneer lumber that's glued, and then and then clamps are just clamped between the top and the bottom, literally to just sort of lock that together and, and it's clamped mode until the glue goes off. And then the oversized diamond um, braces are removed, and this is where they go into a CNC milling machine process. So this is the virtual software that, so that, that they're created and those presses oversized and then the saws will come in and, and saw them down to their actual size. So this CNC milling machine uses circular saws, which is, you can see there. And then it also has um, drill or saw holes and all of the the small three-dimensional notches and everything that have to be notched out and holes drilled, so that the final, um, the, the the final shape is is produced. And again, this is just another example of of those joints that we saw before in the photograph, where the seismic joint, um, the seismic fuse comes in. They're all milled out of. Um, three pieces out of one chunk of LVL, and then three, three and a half of those go into a milling bed. So this is a way of optimizing the amount of time that the milling machine is operating, so that they can work out the time frame it's going to take to manufacture it, and, um, you know, before they even do the real thing. So then, um, this is just, this is just a bit of real life footage of of one of those um, milling machines this isn't actually the, the, the scion job, but it, it sort of shows the inner workings of one of the CNC milling machines. So the robot will pick up a circular saw, will pick up a router, will pick up a drill, um, all in the same milling bed. And so when that um, comes out of there, it pretty much just looks like this. So you can see the sides have been sawn, um, the notches on the side where the steel, um, the steel fuses are connected, um, milled out and routed, ready for action. And then there's also holes drilled through there for the bolts. Um, and so this is us just down in the factory during construction, um, just inspecting the first of these to come out and just, just to look at the quality of the edges, any imperfections, and any ways that we can sort of help uh, refine the process to ensure the quality when we end up putting the project together on site. 
Um, and there's the, the, there's the warehouse. So, yeah, it's, it, apart from that milling machine, it's a pretty sort of low tech operation. It's just a big warehouse with a gantry for moving these things about. And then they, um, they, they get stacked and stored. And this is one of the challenges is doing a building on a larger scale. Um, these are quite large objects. They're eight meters by four meters in dimension. So the, you need a sort of storage facility. We want to avoid double handling. We managed because Simon's is, is only a 2000 square meter building. We managed to sort of um, handle these once they were stacked and then they were transported to site. And this is um, this is a this is a little video actually of the erection of, of those on site. That's just a bit of a this is day one. So all of those diagrams were assembled, um, lifted off trucks and placed in place within 24 hours. So that's basically a 24 hour um, end of the day. I don't know what we got there about 20 or so diagrams erected in one day. So it shows the potential for this um, to speed up construction um, and, and, and get a building built in, in, in a much shorter space of time. So you can see there the, the steel plates on the end of that diagram, and then um, they were pulled apart and blocked until everything was, was all squared up, and then those seismic fuses went down at the last minute. So that's probably day three or four. So the diagrids, or it might be a bit later than that, to be honest, because the diagrids all go up and then the, um, the CLT floor units go in. So the diagrids are all LDL, and then the, the floor units are all CLT. So they're L-shaped uh, floor units. Uh, so like a double T precast, but an L, so it's, they, they're very much like a precast element. They'd be a, an eight meter length by two meters with the downstand being all built in. And that creates these pre-made floor units that, that were also craned into, into place. So you can see them there. Um, so that downstand of about 600 is fixed to the flooring unit. So it becomes a solid, um, 80 millimeter thick CLT floor with the downstand beam. And that beam goes across and is connected to um, a perimeter beam, which sits on a small corbel that you can see on the diagrid here, if you can see my cursor. Um, so that diagrid is made with a small corbel that, that seats the beam on it, and then the, the flooring units come down and sit and seat on the top of that perimeter beam. So th this sort of part of it is quite similar to precast concrete construction, but you can see here that on the left hand side, these are CLT walls that um, are, are becoming partitions for uh, meeting rooms, and that's a CLT lift shaft, so there's a lift shaft that goes through, so everything you can see here is timber. And that's about day, um, well, let's say, that's about probably three months into the build. We're up to the top levels, all the flooring units are in place and the roof's about to go off. You can also see here the concrete um, perimeter beams. So it's a CLT ground floor as well. Perimeter beams um, just, just run across to connect the building to the ground because um, we can't put the timber straight on the ground. It's also a seismically high seismic zone, road a lot of geothermal activity here. So that, um, that's, that sits on a raft slab foundation, or not even a raft slab, actually just deep and wide perimeter ground beams, but it has a sort of a raft sort of system. There's no piles, just allows us to the building to float on the ground and shake and move and the earthquake bed with everything timber um, whittling around on top of it. Closer shot during construction, um, there's one of the sort of more or less finished shell shots of the building from the second level. Um, and then the, the end of the um, project shot there, because I'm just going to move on and talk about facade. But this gives you, these, these are the professional shots at the end of the project. So, I mean, I think the thing to note here is that the structure is so fine and thin connections very light. If we were to make this building out of steel or concrete, the member sizes would be twice as thick. That's only 80 millimetres wide on that top level of diagram. That's 120 on the top bottom two levels, and then we downsize to 80 on the third level. So it's a very fine and elegant form of construction. 
So moving to the facade, um, there was, a, uh, there was a, in New Zealand we undertake um, quite seriously consultation with the local iwi, which is a Maori word for tribe, the local tribe of the Maori people that have always had um, ownership or guardianship of the land that we're building on. So some of the approaches to the building have been influenced by our consultation and the creation of the three peaks in the entrance. I mean, obviously it's a triangular building, so it worked nicely architecturally to do this, but we have a main entrance through the middle and two sub peaks, and that relates to three sub tribes that make up the main tribe. So there's identity for the people within those, um, within those forms. And then in terms of the coloured glass, we just looked to the forest. There's the native forest in New Zealand, which has no deciduous trees. And then there's the exotic forest of the pine trees and the imported trees that the Europeans brought to New Zealand post um, colonialization. And Sion, of course, does their research across both the native forestry and the exotic forestry, because the exotic forestry is what creates New Zealand's forestry industry, mainly radiated pine, which is um, which is harvested for construction and paper production. So we initially looked at um, creating a, a, a facade and, and fritted coloured glass that that sort of went from the autumn leaves to the evergreen leaves across the facade. You can see in some early development drawings where we were considering a, a diagrid glazing system as well. Um, and then we reverted to a vertical glazing system that incorporated the diamond um, fritting into the glass. So this was pretty much the final development drawings. But the, it's not just a decorative glass and that fritting is not just on there um, for decoration. It's, it's working harder um, than that. It's producing shading to the, to the interior of the building, um, reducing solar glare. The glass itself is double glazed with a low E leaf on the inside and the outside, so it's high performance glass. And then the colour frit, depending on the orientation to north, south, east and west, has a different percentage of open aperture to allow more light into the south facade of tree has 20%. And then, and then only 40% and 40 block out on the northern facades, western 45, and there's not a lot of glass on the western side of the building. So we're using a specifically designed printing system to chop out the light depending on its um, orientation to the sun. And these are some of the early exploratory drawings that we mapped out a system where we could just, each diamond of color is made up of um, hundreds of diamonds of um, frit that is baked on glass with colour and that controls the amount of light coming in and out through the facade. So that's that all about facade optimization. Um, in the end, it almost appears like a stained glass, but it's actually opaque paint on, on the um, glass layer. So we've also got um, a, a double skin facade. So while we've got double glazed everywhere on the exterior of the building, um, the darker panel you can sort of see there with the green and blue, um, basically that left hand third of the front facade and the right hand third off screen have double facades with 800 millimetres of gap between the front and rear facade. And so these create plenums that allow us to preheat air in a winter condition with the morning sun. So as the air in that plenum receives the morning sunlight, it will increase in temperature and it will rise. And so it's really just taking two or three degrees of load off the air conditioning system by preheating that air. And in the summer, we do the opposite. We take the, um, the cooler air and then we, we bring it into the air conditioning systems to take a couple of uh, degrees off the, um, the air conditioning load of, of that building. But it's fair to say also that this is a mixed mode building. The, um, I'll just go back to that draw of that photograph there, you can see one little frame here where there's a number of these uh, window, warning windows that can open on a building management system so that the building will self-ventilate when it gets to a certain degree um, anyway. And so it's really only through the extreme winter and the extreme summer that the building will seal up completely and just rely on this preheating and pre-cooling through the double facade and the air conditioning system. But during the shoulder seasons, the building, the air conditioning system can, can wind right down and just allow the passive air 
to um, to do the actual heating and cooling of the building, maintain the right temperature. These are just some of our um, our, our BIM drawings to sort of show how we coordinated all of the services between consultants. So the blue drawings are the sort of mechanical systems. All of the plant were under the building. Um, the air handling units all under the building there, so we kept it all off the roof. Um, and then we only exhausted air through the, through the roof. And then, of course, it's a challenge about how we particulate all of that through the ceilings. Um, so there's an enormous amount of um, ceiling reticulation that I'll just talk you through now. Um, the white ceiling panels you can see there are for acoustic control. And every second bay of those flooring units is um, has that lowered white ceiling, and every other bay has the timber because we, we and the client wanted to expose as much timber in this building as possible. If we had everything down at that white level, you wouldn't appreciate the depth of those deep beams. So this is um, cross-section through the building. So through those lowered ceiling areas, we're able to reticulate all of the ducted air um, services. And then we were hanging um, exposed lighting off that. And then in the, in the lifted coppers, we've got uh, sprinkler systems that are articulated through the building. And then we've, we've actually got acoustic um, treatment on the higher and the lower panels. And then we've got a raised floor where all of the electrical services are articulated through the floor. And that raised floor sits on isolated cradles to prevent footfall acoustic transmission of the um, footfall from above the floor to the level below. These are just some of the early um, BIM models to explore the services and the reticulation of those. And we model all of these through the buildings to detect clashes for the pipe services, um, air and liquids. Then these went into large shop drawings as they normally would. This is just a photo showing that cradle system. So you can see these um, little black seats that the, the timber bat can sit on, the acoustic absorption material, and then the timber, timber plywood flooring over the top with, with carpet, recyclable carpet over the top of that. And then you can also sort of see behind the, the feet where the, um, the, the cable ducts are running with the data cables and electrical separated on each side of that duct. So that's, um, that's just before the floor goes down. And that's floor down. And so this is just a bit later in construction where we're creating bulkheads. So you can sort of see, just sort of see an um, a air distribution unit there that's, that's going to be covered by the lower ceiling. And then that runs into the slower bulkhead. So everything's fed through the back of the building and then horizontally out every second one of these coffers um, to feed the building. So it's quite a simple service of strategy, but some of you will appreciate the complexity of trying to coordinate all of that stuff. So that so all of these holes were pre-drilled in the beams, um, milled in that CNC milling machine. So all of this coordination work was done. Um, a lot more coordination done at the desk and the studio to ensure that everything can be located because um, Unlike a concrete or steel building where you can just get a little bit of a concrete saw and there's a hole through here and there, it's a you can do that with timber as well. But um, the structural engineer has pretty limited areas where these things can be penetrated, so it allows us to get it all right before the building goes into place. And it's pretty dense, you know, there's a bunch of um, bunch of stuff in there that only just fits, as you can see, but it all got there at the end of the day. So that's sort of first fit, it's almost complete. Um, and then the ceiling tiles go on, and that's pretty much the finished product. And then the lighting is about to um, come next. Um, so you can see the finished ceiling there. The upper area has the um, sprinkler system, and the lower area is the diffusers for the air conditioning. And then this is just the cafe level, so it has more decorative lighting. But um, in the office level, we've got more beam LED beam fittings. So the, the stairs, they um, the stairs are, were, were quite a quite a triumph structurally as well. They're, they're made from um, solid CLT by XLAM, and there there are a stair system called air stairs. 
so that they come to site as a single piece, uh, like a precast concrete would too. So with a landing, a flight, and a landing, and uh, all solid, all milled out of solid CLT as a, almost like a precast timber unit. And so you can see here the build up through the stair, and then we've got um, we had to have sprinklers on these stairs as well, so the sprinkler pipes, and. In order, I'll just go back to that shot there. You'll notice there's no this cantilever from the upper flight to the mid flight, so there's no structure. These are cantilevering landings, um, and the timber could actually handle all that, but they were to prevent the swinging of the stairs. Um, some stiffness needed to be added, so these stairs do actually have a steel plate that is fixed there in the grey, and that was also needed to. Um, Fix the cantilevered glass balustrades too, but then that's covered with a with a timber um, timber capping. So and then the feet of the stair is a plywood shell. So the whole thing appears timber. But you can see there the construction. The stair just just gone in um, with the steel plate wrapping around it, um, and then the finished stair with the timber capping over the top. But we wanted to sort of show the honesty of that, so that's why that black negative exists. You can actually, when you're walking up the stair, if you look up through that black negative, you can see the steel. So we're not trying to tell any fibs about it. Um, but that bit of steel and the seismic fuse are pretty much the only steel in the building, apart from this, this thing, remember that in the, the diagram where we showed what was red, that this is the double facade you can see in the background, and there needed to be some steel gantry to sort of hold those two facades apart and to, to receive the aluminium joinery. So, um, at the end of the day, well, just tour through the building, I guess, in terms of the final photographs, uh, the new public front door. So, this is the big welcoming gesture to the, to, the, to the public. For the first time in 60 years, this campus is now able to be visited by the public in almost a, a user experience, museumology sort of way. So, you can arrive here, have a pizza, bring your kids, have a look at the exhibition, and understand you know, what goes on in this mysterious campus and all the amazing things that they produce. Um, you can come inside, you can sit there, you can see the wood fire pizza oven out the back there. It's only appropriate that the, the, the pizza is, is cooked with the wood, same wood that the building is built out of. Um, and then you can see on the upper levels the, the, um, the private science areas, and this green glass gateway here is, is a turnstile that, that has. Um, that had swipe card access only to allow people to get up to those upper levels. So the, the lovely separate, there's a lovely combination really between the sort of public and, and science. Here's the reception desk, we had some fun. Um, that's just laminated plywood. So Scion wanted to showcase as many different timber products as possible. So we had plywood, um, CNC mill reception desk with the LVL um, diagrids, we had the CLT floors. We have plywood acoustic perforated panels above reception here. We had cork resilient flooring on the ground floor. So um, everything you can see there is, is pretty much the timber. Just another shot through the public cafe. And it has this wonderful sort of quality where people want to touch it, kids want to sit on it. Um, you don't see too many people doing this on steel or concrete, but it's, it's a, just has the sort of quality about it that people love to sort of get close and touch and, and be part of. This is just a shot of the public exhibition. So this will rotate, this will be changed every two or three years, but it sort of just sort of showcases, like you might imagine in a museum, different things that are going on, wood polymers that are used for um, 3D printing, um, you know, technology for making um, heat, heat treated timber for construction. Um, and, and all sorts of cool and wonderful things like that, interactive, so the kids can get involved. Um, and then there's the sort of collaborative workspaces where the, where the science goes on, um, on the upper level, levels that I talked about. These are these upper levels here. So there's a collaborative um, modern workplace sort of environment where you've got some collaborative zones and you've got desk, desking zones um, for, for working and things can be um, moved around, changed, very flexible. 
So just for the last five or ten minutes, um, just some talk about the the consultation with um, what we what we term as mana whenua. Whenua means land, and mana means important people. So the most important people to the land are the, the tribe that lives that that have always lived there. And because because we engaged in such a successful way, the tribe gifted the name to Whare Nui Tutiata, which basically means the great house. So this is the great house of Sion, and um, that name, you can't just use these words, um, you have to have them gifted to you. So it was a great honour to have the local Māori tribe um, gift the, the, the name of the, the, name of the um, building to us. And as part of that consultation, the, 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 some stories have been interwoven into the building. This is, sort of, this is lying on the floor looking at the ceiling of the atrium. And the arrangement of the lights um, are based on, on the, 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 um, the star pattern of, of the constellation, which is called Matariki, and that marks the, the Māori New Year. So the, the, the year starts when this constellation appears in the sky, in the southern sky in New Zealand. Um, so that, that, that arrangement of, of large bright stars and the major stars and then the smaller lights that aren't turned on, that's, that's sort of mapped that sky onto the ceiling. And then, um, and as you can see there, so we've literally just taken, taken the sky and mapped it onto the ceiling. But there's, science, there's scientists here too, so all of those acoustic batons, so all the arrangement of the patterning the batons is, um, is for acoustic reasons. But that sort of relates to the DNA structure of the Pinus radiata, which is the species of timber that the building is made out of. So we've got this sort of sort of lovely sort of references and stories that are interwoven. Um, the the fascia panels on the outside here, um, just like a Maori meeting house, this the, these are, are patterns that are also negotiated and consulted and received as gifts from the from the local Maori tribe. And they've been CNC mills digitally carved. So um, there was a local artist that we worked with, and he produced the drawings. We digitised them, and then they went to the CNC milling machine to be milled onto those um, facial panels of the of, of the entrance. So that's another acknowledgement of the people of the land. Um, now, sort of, yeah, just to finish off with, I like, guess, embodied energy. Um, big part of this project, embodied carbon. So this building at the time of completion um, is a, was an embodied carbon zero. And so we used a company called eTool. Um, they operate out of Australia and Europe. They're a European company and they, they're, a sort of, they're a consultancy that measure um, carbon buildings. So we handed over our bill models with all of our quantities, uh, our quantities of scheduled quantities. And so they did all of the number crunching and you know, so first of all, we're talking about operational energy here. And so the, the graph on the left-hand side the, is a reference building um, of where we are at the moment. The, the right-hand side, if we look at the bottom level here, um, the, the right-hand side is the British Institute of Architects have set targets for 2030. Um, our building is in the middle here at 80 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Um, that's almost meeting the 2030 targets for for, um, that they have in Britain right now. Um, so it's 10 years ahead of where it should be in terms of its operational carbon use. So that was that's low carbon running. It's not carbon zero operational, but it's incredibly, uh, it's, it's almost, well, it's less than half of a, of a current benchmark building. And body of carbon was, was quite a triumph. We, we weren't quite expecting this, but the, um, the amount of carbon associated with the timber in the building, and there's, there's 500 cubic metres of it, which is half a million kilograms of carbon is sequestered in that timber, it's captured in that timber. Um, so therefore it has a sort of a, a negative carbon quotient, which is approximately equivalent to all of the carbon associated in the concrete and steel and the aluminium in the building. So therefore the two cancel each other out and it's considered carbon zero from an embodied energy point of view. And the other really cool statistic here is that if you look at the entire pine forest in New Zealand, it would only take that pine forest 35 minutes to grow enough timber for the building, for, for, for this building to be built. So that's, um, that's pretty 
pretty amazing sort of statistic that embodied energy and how it compares with targets. Um, and then just to collect just a couple of shots here to, to finish off with through the atrium. That was before it was occupied, but um, gives you a nice clean feel for the for the minimal structure. And then you know, as as the evening drops, it glows and it sits here on the on the side of this forest um, as a sort of a beacon, a lighthouse, um, sitting within the forest. So so that's um, I think that's pretty much it. I think that might be the last slide. Yeah. So so there we go. Hey, over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. Truly exceptional building. Like. You guys have laid it with so much meaning and it's truly a product of its time, of its cultural location, its geographic location from a structural point of view, the way that it gets made in the modern world and the current economics associated with that. It really is of its time and it's inspirational. Um, I, I particularly love how the um, how the structure is, as you, as you mentioned, very, very elegant and very clever the way that it integrates the vertical as well as the lateral um requirements into one into one diagrid um was that and, and going back to the very beginning how that influence of of the lateral and vertical loading very pragmatic influenced the 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 evolution of the first competition and then this diagram which is a, a quite a leap from the um from the rather simple well simple in one sense this is also quite simple in a different sense, the um, shear walls that you originally had. Um, how did that diagrid first get penned? Was that a structural engineering thing or was that you guys or was that um, something from a sign office? Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was an early discussion between ourselves and the, um, and the structural engineer. Um, the original competition only ever envisaged a single story building. So there was, you wouldn't do a diagrid single story building. So that, that was never really considered there. There was a, solution the solution for that single story building would still be the best solution for that single story building it was when they asked us to go for three stories we 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 knew we had to consider a different um, strategy for structure mm -hmm. and um you know in new zealand there seemed to be a number of recent buildings that that were going up around the city of auckland with a diagrid concrete or a diagrid steel building so we just sort of said what about this for timber and yeah, structural engineer love the idea because it's um you know to know a triangle is an extremely efficient structural um, shape, and so it, it really it really offered a, a lot. Uh, and so that was quite a quick start. We just said right, let's diagram it, and then all the fun began when we began when we entered into trying to unlock how to do it in the most innovative, low carbon way. Mm. Everything about this building is really getting the most out of out of out of wood. Do you see this? Um, do you see this being used on on other structures? Have you tried to apply this on on on, on different projects? Um, I would I, I would would like to point out in particular the that section that you had of the um, of the structure with the. Um, uh, services of particulation or not showed an 820 mil floor depth, which is acceptable on a site where you, you have many more more height lines. But um, one of the things that tends to become difficult when you want to apply timber where concrete or steel is like typically is um, typically used is getting is getting over that floor depth requirement, which of course you know, timber is great when you have um, nice fine tall tall depths. Um, yeah, how do you see this being applied in other projects? Yeah, well, um, yeah. So it's a four meter floor to floor, which which gives us um, up to the floor build up and the beam, beam depths um, just over three meters from the lowest beam floor to floor to other side of beam. So um, this is this is very applicable, and I'll talk about it really quickly. A couple of future projects we're working on with this system. It's not it's not really applicable for a residential situation. You're, you're much better off with just. Um, you know, CLT slabs for small cellular apartment rooms. So this sort of suits uh, office building or open plan office environments where there's not a lot of cellular um, subdivision. And to that end, we are currently working on a pretty exciting um, project, which is 10,000 square meters. So uh, this is 2,000, so that's um, five times the size and it 
it um, follows a similar width, width, but if you can imagine that building um, five times as long, and then we've just curved it around into a sort of a ribbon, so it's almost like a donut. Um, that, that's the current project we're working on, and it's only we're only going for three stories, and in some parts it's only two, so that's a 10,000 square metre office building that we're working on in a campus sort of environment. But we're also got a current project which goes to eight stories using this diagrid, again for an office environment in an urban setting. We were doing, we've got a concrete plinth for the car park and, and retail level, and then it goes eight stories off that. So it's, it's nine stories high. So it, this, this technology can go to sort of eight or nine stories. Awesome. That's that's spectacular. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's inspirational. Yeah. Um, have you, on that note, have you witnessed, obviously you've been in the game for a little, a little while now. Um, have you witnessed much of a change? Like, could this have been done in years gone by or is this really something that, can only, that is of its time now? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I wish it could have been and would it have been done in years gone by. But, um, I, you know, I think that as the human race, we've been really slow to realise the, um, the, magnitude of the problem of climate change and i think there's been a sort of sweet spot over the last few years where you know with the likes of cop 26 25 24 the last three cop conferences have unequivocally um stated that we're buggered in terms of the client <laughs> the climate and so there has been and the government's getting on board right so the government's getting on board and they're making policy to reduce carbon emissions and 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 so therefore it's becoming part of our regulations part of our building code so everybody's waking up to it so everyone's scrambling so sort of how can we do this best so consequently the production side is is beefing up in this country the prices are starting to come down for supply but is it too much too late uh too little too late i don't know you know i wish it had started earlier um but but we are we are where we are so we, we're in the business of just trying to promote as many timber buildings as we can with our with our clients that walk in the door so you would say it's it's been more a policy um outcome rather than a purely economic um result yeah well i think um or an aesthetic result yeah yeah look i think timber construction has always probably been considered a bit of a luxury to do this sort of thing um rather than necessity and, and it is a necessity it has been a necessity as i was just mentioning for quite a few years but um so yeah what i love about this project is it's been built to showcase what can be done on on a, on a taxpayer budget and it is what it is because everything it does, it does to be low carbon and it does. Mm. And, and it looks the way it looks because of that reason as architects, that's um, a sort of a, a mantra that sort of grew out of the modernist movement, you know, um, form follows function. Follow function. <laughs> yeah. So if form follows function, if social need follows, um, you know, if social need is the function and the form is following social need and climatic need and, and, um, a sustainable need then buildings will look like this because they need to look like this and uh and and you know and i started off with the hansel and gretel house in the glass box but you know i think we you know this project proves that we can make elegant and beautiful buildings and and so that's the challenge for architects is is use wood and use it innovatively and um, we can still be really creative architects excellent no that's awesome Really exciting to see what's going to come up, up soon, um, despite the the slight tone of, of desperation in the background. But um, better late than never. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen, share a few things, and then we'll wrap up. So thanks so much for joining me this morning, Rich, and presenting that. That was excellent. So the Timber Design Awards for 2022 are now closed. So keep posted for the judging and the information related to the celebration which will happen in early december and lastly i'd like to comment on the australian mass timber full scale test program if you're interested in getting involved with that please reach out to us about that i'd also like to quickly share about the next webinar in our webinar series on tuesday the 4th of october at 11 a.m what could what wood could learn from steel and concrete 
turning challenges into innovation opportunities. This one is going to be presented, presented by Carl Heinz Weiss of Lendlease, the head of R&D there and the technical director of DFMA. So that's not going to be one to miss. And so we hope that you can join, join, us, join us for that one. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks all. Bye.